Welcome to Pop Culture Retro, which was recently voted the 15th best podcast by the residents of the Golden Years Retirement Community in Boca Raton, Florida. Each show, we'll revisit some of your favorite pop culture memories with insider and outsider perspectives. Now, please help me welcome your hosts, Ike Eisenman and Jonathan Rosen. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Pop Culture Retro. I'm one of your hosts, Jonathan Rosen, along with Ike Eisenman. And today, we are thrilled to welcome the creator of one of the all-time classic book series. It has sold well over 250 million copies. It also happened to be my personal favorite series as a kid. Uh, the creator of the Choose Your Own Adventure series, Edward Packard. Edward, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, I'm glad to be here. It's fun to talk to you. Thank you. I'll start with saying I was thrilled that you agreed to come on. Uh, since this book series always had a special place in my heart, I devoured the books, and I still think of it as among my favorite series of all time. Uh, specifically, and I think I wrote this to you, it makes me think of my dad, because whenever I was with him in the malls, like Walden Books or B. Dalton's, he would buy me another one. So the really, the series does really hold a special place to me. Uh, so thank you for doing it again. Uh, I was reading that this first started with you telling bedtime stories to your daughters. Uh, where did the ideas first come from to make this an interactive adventure? Well, I uh, I, I was always interested in adventure books. And uh, I think the two books that mo meant most to me when I was a kid, uh, reading, uh, learning to read pretty well, grown-up books were Treasure Island and uh, Gulliver's Travels. And they were both uh, where a guy is uh, uh, on a strange island and has various adventures. So when I was making up stories for the kids, I thought, uh, you know, I'm doing an adventure story like that. So uh, I thought, what do kids think? Kids like sugar. How about Sugar Cane Island? And uh, so uh, I, I got my kid. I got I thought of a kid being shipwrecked, and I said uh started telling a story and then uh i couldn't think of what to happen next in the story so i asked the kids uh well what would you do now you know in, in this situation you've washed up on the beach you're going to climb up the rocky hill or walk along the beach you got to find somebody to help you get some food and stuff and uh so you got i got it different answers and uh, pretty soon i had uh uh, branching plots. <laughs> what would you do well, if you did this? What would happen if you did that? What would happen? And so it just uh, worked out that way. And uh, as I've told people that uh, if I'd been a really good storyteller, I could have thought up the whole thing and just rattled it <laughs> off. <laughs> so if it, if I hadn't gotten stuck and needed some help, uh, it wouldn't have become interactive. <laughs> well, you had originally been a lawyer. Was story self storytelling something that you always wanted to do as well, or did it just kind of come uh, out of this? Well, uh... Yeah, I think I, I my my brother, my older brother went was went to law school. My uncle was a law professor, uh, and so it was really the course of least resistance because uh, I I hadn't really thought of much but he did like writing and making up stories and stuff like that so uh it was kind of an opportunity to do something I was really more emotionally involved in mm -hmm. well you when, when did it change from something that you were just doing like as bedtime stories for your daughter that you had this idea that you wanted to turn it into a book yeah I well no I well when I I was commuting at the time, and I was, uh, and uh, after telling the stories and getting the inter interactive aspect of it, I, it be, I naturally occurred to me, you know, how could this work out as a book? And it, the answer, and I so fiddled around with it. It was, it was very hard to get a book going and think of the multiple plots without uh, getting very confused. Uh, so I managed to make up flow charts and took it from there. Well, yeah, that's what we, we saw that you have these huge charts to keep track of all the possible endings. How is that structured and how long does it take you to, to map out? Because it seems like you you say you, you think you were a better storyteller, you tell one story, but I think it takes a far better story storyteller to come up with so many, so many different outcomes. Well, 
the way I, I did the the uh, figure out how to make the chart was to have a like a tree uh, lying horizontally uh, with the trunk and the trunk is the uh, at the bottom of the trunk is the the beginning of the story what happens and then there bra it branches out uh, and so suppose you have a choice then you make a line and uh, going up higher and, and on the top of the line you'd say what the choice is and then I make made some key words for the plot what happens when you've turned to that page and then on the lower branch uh, the same thing and then it keeps branching and if I uh, get to an end I just uh, put a dot like uh, the, the at that particular twig is the end of the story and sometimes uh, they merge into each other mm -hmm. uh, where if you took course A uh, and you, you you might end up at the same place you ended up at if you took course B, but uh, everything has from then on, as the story progresses from then on, everything has to be consistent with your having either gone to course A or course B earlier earlier in the story. <laughs> So, you know, uh, it, it just sort of grew organically, like a tree in a way. <laughs> <laughs> right, right around the same time, there was like, like, you know, the Dungeons and Dragons is starting to hit and the, the Infocom computer games like Zork, where you made choices, both interactive forms of storytelling. Were, were you aware of them at the time? Well, uh, I, I when I thought up this thing, it was in... Uh, 1969 really so it was way back and i i don't think uh, dungeons and dragons were uh, uh, were around then although it, they they became very prominent uh, later on i think in the in the 1970s or 80s mm -hmm. um but uh, i didn't know of anything like this at all at that time uh and but as as uh, the problem was that I managed to get an agent who sent this book around um, to some major publishers, but they all turned it down. So I just put it in the desk drawer and it wasn't until years later, uh, around 1976, I believe, that uh, I managed to get it published by a small press. And uh, then the story goes on from, from there. <laughs> Well, you had mentioned you had mentioned Sugarcane Island was the the first one. What what was that initial story about the Sugarcane Island one? Do you remember like what what the first initial plot was? Yes, well, pretty much. So you basically uh, I, the idea is you get get the reader, you the reader, washed up on a on a strange island, the sort of thing where Gulliver's you know with uh, Gulliver's Travels, another example, but uh, Robinson Crusoe was a classic example. I, I forget how Robinson, I think he was, oh yeah, he was shipwrecked uh, in his ship where, where the, I guess everybody else drowned, but he made it to shore. And um, uh, so I had my uh, reader uh, washed up on the, <coughs> the big tidal wave or something like that, uh, washes him in. And so you're, you're, you, the reader, you're washed up on the beach on this strange island, which is more or less tropical, but it's got it's got a beach and then it's got hills and a lot of, so it's it seems to be deserted and uh, you're stuck there. And so then, uh, you know, uh, you encounter if you climb up the rocky hill, for instance, you 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 see smoke in the distance and it looks like there's a settlement and. Uh, so you you meet some uh, local characters and animals and things and uh, you, uh, so I can't remember too many details except I always remember that there was one situation where you got in quicksand and I had, <laughs> I had said that if you 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 fall into quicksand which is where there's water running underneath and the the sand is is. It looks like sand, but actually, it's so filled with water that you, you, you could drown in it. Uh, and uh, so people do drown in it. Uh, and so th there is a way to to uh, behave uh, successfully if you fall into quicksand, which is you want to lie down flat, and then it's sort of like uh, being a. a in the water swimming and you can sort of slosh your way 
to the shore or to to firm ground that way. But if you try to be vertical and walk, uh, you you you're likely to sink. So I thought that was a really good to sit, situation to put the reader in. And uh, so you have these two choices of which to do. And if you do the right one, uh, you you get get to get get back to hard land. All right. But if you try to to walk out of it and and thrash around, it's the glug glug glug. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that was another thing aspect of it is trying to keep uh, you know not to not to be gruesome or or scare kids <laughs> like that, but to try to put, particularly when I was thinking of younger readers sure. in this session to try to make it you know humorous. And uh, that worked out pretty well. Well, you, you just said when you initially presented it to publishers, everyone turned it down. How long did it take you to find a home for it um, the second time you uh, sent it out? Well, I actually, uh, it was it was about uh, five ye five or six years, wow. and I just had for, said, "Well, it's too bad; it's not, it's not making it." But uh, then I, I saw an article in, uh, I was on a, on a ski weekend in Vermont and it said uh, small small press uh, publishing uh, in Vermont called Vermont Crossroads Press is looking for innovative children's books. And I thought, well, this is innovative. So I said, <laughs> it there and it took it from there. But then uh, there's a tremendous amount of complexity thereafter, which I would try to summarize oh, yeah. <laughs> so that, that's where that's where uh, r.a montgomery came in right then that's where montgomery came in yeah, montgomery. exactly montgomery and his then wife uh uh were running this small press so anyway they published sugar cane allen uh and but you know a small press and he uh montgomery was very good at the marketing and he got uh he took a survey in a local school to see how the kids liked it, and the kids were crazy about it. And so it all looked pretty good. But uh, I thought, well, my, you know, this isn't uh, a small press is not going to get very great distribution. Mm -hmm. So I went. I, I, I by this time I had met a, uh, somebody who had a. A uh, friend or his brother or somebody was uh, uh, at Lippincott, which was then uh, a well-known publishing company, it was later bought by Harper and Row, and uh, so I published two books with that with them, uh, and uh, which they called "Choose Your Own Adventures in the Wild West" and "Choose Your Own Adventures in Outer Space," incidentally, but then. They weren't very smart at marketing, and they didn't trademark uh, their their slogan. And uh, meanwhile, Montgomery, when uh, he was able to find an agent uh, who had a really good contact at uh, Bantam Books, and uh, they said they they were going to run with it. And the Bantam Books people uh, said they would put a lot behind it and put all their marketing muscle behind it. And, so forth. So uh, they wanted me in on it. So I, I came in the sort of the back door to ban on books, which I could see was going to do a lot more with it, the idea than Lippincott had. And so then, then it proceeded from that. And that's how it got to be a, a, a major series. So at first, you you weren't even involved. <laughs> you were the creator, and you had to come in afterwards. That's that's right. That's wow. the way life works. You know, a lot <laughs> a lot of things are very ironic, and uh, um, <laughs> but uh, just take what you can get. And I uh, uh, I if I'd been two percent less lucky, I would have had nothing. And if I'd been two percent more lucky, I would have. Probably gotten rich really. Yeah. Oh, and speaking of which, you had to help with the publishing costs originally. Originally, yeah, because these people were they were running on a shoestring. Wow. Uh, they're trying to sell Man. their books. It was a very noble thing they had, but their books, you know, it's a Vermont farm and uh, Vermont this and that, and it was their their books to try to get kids interested in reading and. It was a noble thing, but it, they, it wasn't very 
uh, lucrative for them. They were just barely getting along. And and actually, uh, Montgomery said he, he thought they liked to publish it, but they uh, were really a little strapped for fun. Wow. So it's just been, uh, wow. So how, how long did it take you to see that that first book was a success, though? That, you know, even though it was, you know, small publisher, that, that this was going, was hitting big? Well, right? well uh, the, considering it was a small press, they were getting a very good response for it. And also, but even before that, when uh, Montgomery, uh, he went, I think he had a friend who was a, taught fifth grade in a local school. And he said, uh, we'll make a, a copies of all this and, and give it to the kids. We'd like to do a survey. And the teacher thought, well, this is educational. We'll make our kids uh, uh, book critics. And uh, and so they took the survey. And it was the kids were wildly enthusiastic. And, uh, uh, and uh, so I kind of felt, well, this these kids are representative of, of kids all over. So this this could really do very well so so how long was it before you know montgomery asked you about writing some of the books himself yeah well he uh he of course when i went off to to Libincott, thinking well a small press can't do very well i mean you can't get the kind of volume that a major publisher could get well, it was very natural for montgomery to say well, wait a minute i was the first publisher here i i uh uh, I want to write these books and uh, and see what I can do. And he, it was actually his, as I remember, his wife uh, Connie, who found the the went to a to a book fair, uh, pu you know, a publishing uh, so show, and met the agent that said, "Well, I think we can do something with that." So, uh, so that's how we were uh, working on parallel paths so to speak so so he is he so he's the one that got bantam involved to begin with pardon me he he's the one that got bantam involved uh yeah uh that well his a the, he found his wife found the agent uh right. okay. and the agent had the very good contact at bantam and so she talked to the uh, the the bantam editor who who thought who realized that this could be a big series <laughs> and as i remember she her name was joelle del borgo she was a young editor at bantam and she was so excited about it. she talked to the president and she she talked the president of bantam into, into doing this at those in those days by the way nearly all children's books were um uh, hardcover and uh the 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 idea of a mass market uh, uh, children's book simply uh, it wasn't wasn't out there and uh, they said we can have racks in bookstores and uh, with a whole several copies of the series and this was a quite an innovation at the time uh, and it was one reason that the the series went that went well. Mm -hmm off big and also Bantam sent a lot of copies to teachers and booksellers and stuff and really promoted it uh, and then I uh, they uh, it was written up in the New York Times and then uh, wow. the publicity agent got me on the Today, Today Show and that, that gave it a big boost. Wow <laughs> <laughs> and at this point you and Ray were splitting duties on writing the books? Yeah well uh uh, at this by this point, although we we were at once once I uh, when when Bantam gave its first contract and I they uh, I had no contact with them or the agent that it, uh, Ray had found. Uh, I uh, but Bantam wanted me to be in it. Of course, they were good capitalists. They didn't. They wanted a, a monopoly, like. <laughs> rather than be competing with me and Wilfencott and so and uh, and uh, since I started at this the idea uh, <coughs> so, uh, at first Ban uh, Ray was the real the real contractor with Bannon but then from then on uh, Bannon gave us each contracts when they decided to do one book a month uh, oh. 
uh, and obviously neither of us could write one book a month. Mm. And so we each actually, act, act, but they awarded us contracts each for six books a year. And, uh, but we could pick out other writers to subcontract to. Mm -hmm. So there were many different writers. Uh, and so I had my subcontractors and Ray had his subcontractors. And uh, uh, I, my, the agent recommended various writers who would be good for that. And uh, I, I knew of a few myself. Uh, and so uh, that's the way we were able to produce books at that rate. Did you have to consult each other? Like, you know, I'm doing a book on this or he's doing a book on that. Uh, so you didn't. Uh, I was, uh, I, we may have talked occasionally about it, but I, as I remember, I just submitted it to Bantam's editor and they, and uh, Ray did the same. And uh, I'm sure that uh, Bantam, if they saw the two, two books were going to be on exactly the same topic. Right. <laughs> uh, they would have uh, alerted us, but I don't. Uh, I don't remember that ever happening. Uh, uh, was, so it, it wasn't it wasn't a problem. Was was there a concerted effort to try to keep like the the happy endings equal to the unhappy endings? <laughs> because it seemed like there were a lot more unhappy endings. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, actually, uh, my sense was that the kids really liked. Uh, I like disastrous endings just as much as <laughs> and you know, I have two have a happy endings. So it's like in in one in some books, uh I would have really only one really great ending. And the the idea would be to kind of find that. And the classic <laughs> one of that was the uh inside UFO 5440, I nice. believe. Uh, where there's uh the planet Ultima you're trying to find. And uh, you can't find it uh, uh, because it's not, there was no uh, choice leading there. It's just snuck in there. And uh, so that was that was an example of only one really good ending and all the rest are pretty much disasters. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, speaking of disastrous endings, when did you start? thinking about making the deaths gruesome because some of them are pretty horrific i know i have my copy of the mystery of the maya here um because i wasn't familiar with the the series when i was a, a young person and i'm reading this thinking holy cow this is like some really really scary stuff <laughs> well i can't i can't speak for uh ray's books i i never read any of the of his books in all my books uh there were some Certainly, disa terrible, disastrous endings, but uh, the, <laughs> a lot depended on the tone of it. Uh, you know, what was taken uh, here, uh, with a little humor and in involved, uh, such as the glug glug glug, uh, or and so you never lived to so so and so, um, or uh, it was your that the ending is too horrible to describe. And I, I don't, I never got. <laughs> I will say I never got any complaints about uh, <laughs> being too scary in that regard. I did get a complaint though from one woman, uh, or not exactly a complaint, but she, uh, uh, you know, we, we had a warning page as they called it. Bantam thought of calling it a warning page, which said, do not read this book straight through. Uh, <laughs> this is unlike other books. You go to a particular ending and uh, you get to a particular ending and it's explained it so kids wouldn't be confused and not read it. And this woman, woman wrote me and said, my son is very upset because he violated the warning. <laughs> and the phrase, you know, that something bad would happen to him because he violated the, I thought, gee, this kid is up in, <laughs> it's in too sheltered an environment or something like that but, but i never i never got anybody saying oh uh, the way my child was killed in that terrible <laughs> explosion <laughs> so uh, they liked it and as a matter of fact i i you know i think the it, uh, there was a psychologist named Bruno, Bruno Bettelheim, and he he was expl he explained in a book. This is many, many, many decades ago. Why uh, 
fairy tale books for little kids like Han uh, Hansel and Gretel or something or have such scariness in them and you'd think the kids would be um, uh, traumatized by them but they aren't because they they know that it's not really happening and it's kind of allows them to get close to something like that without without fear that it knowing that it's going to hurt them but uh as i said i think a great deal depends on the tone in which it's written and uh mm. conveys the feeling that can give you a, a sense that this is good fun rather than uh, a real threat to you <laughs> well, one, one of the things that i loved about the choose your own adventure books was the second person narrative <clears throat> because you know it's like you are the main character so i was able to place myself in the heads of whoever i was reading about and, and they were gender neutral but I, I read that bantam wanted to push you into making them boy characters more yeah well on sugarcane island at the very outset well i started out you know like two older kids were girls Right. And uh, so, you know, it's more conscious than some people might be that you would want to be gender neutral. And so I thought, well, we've got the illustrations. Uh, how is the illustrator going to illustrate you? And uh, so uh, I pr proposed that uh, in Sugarcane Allen with, uh, with working with Vermont Crossroad, mm -hmm. Hunt Crossroads Press, that the illustrators show a sort of an androgynous you, and that's what they did. But when it got to Bantam, and Bantam wanted to do the books, they wanted to make the, the character illustrated as a boy. And they told me this fact, that boy uh, girls will read books about boys, but boys won't read books about girls. Sounds sexist, doesn't it? Well, mm. anyway. Um, the, so they went ahead with that. They insisted on that. And after a while, uh, and the girls liked the series too. And after a while, uh, a series came out called Babysitter's Club that was tremendously popular. And uh, uh, and the girl readers began to drain off a bit. Um, uh, and so uh Bantam got panicked about and then he said maybe we should have some some books illustrated as as girls instead of boys so that the girls don't feel <laughs> and uh so those they they did that but that they were right that <laughs> that turned off the boys to some extent and also it it, it, it was kind of lame and uh it didn't I, I think it was not too good an idea Later on, I brought I I had reprints of three of my books, uh, and I brought them under a new series uh, called U Ventures. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, because I couldn't use the the Choose Your Own Adventure trademark, and that's that's a whole other story. By the way, if anyone wants to get a capsule history of this, they can find it at my website edwardpocket.com. <laughs> and I tell how I, the trademark ended up with. Uh, with, with Montgomery, but uh, I had to bring out a series called U Venture. Well, uh, and in that I, we could re. It was with, this was with Simon and Schuster, and uh, we just did three books. And with those books, uh, uh, we just I I suggested, and they agreed. Unlike Phantom, that the illustrations we would be point of view of the reader. So it would always, anything that was illustrated would be as if it was seen through the reader's eyes. And mm -hmm. that way we didn't have to illustrate the reader and we could have true gender neutrality. <laughs> and I think that would have that was would have been the best way to go sure. to begin with. But uh <laughs> uh anyway, that that's that was my feeling about how to how to handle the gender product problem. And in and in the uh in the books, we uh, we never refer, we never had uh, anybody any character in the book refer to you, the reader, as him or her. Right. Nobody would ever say, "Tie him up." He he's likely to get loose. They'd say, uh, uh, "This prisoner's got to be tied up." You know, so they keep it gender neutral. That's so, just fascinating. 
So for a moment, let's talk about some of the individual books that you authored, starting with Cave of Time. And that title launched the series at Bantam. So it was important that it did well, I'm sure. Where did that idea come from? And by the way, I have my copy here. here. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter, Andrea. Uh, and uh, when I said I had a contract with Bantam, uh, uh, she, uh, she uh, and I, she thought up the idea of the, of the cave of time as a as a time travel. So you you uh, you take a what, path A or path B, but if you take path A, you end up in one time and it be another time. This is very much like a time machine, except instead of using the idea of a time machine. Which is it was uh, used by H.G. Wells in his famous classic. Uh, this is another way of getting to a different time. It was just a vehicle uh, of the different uh, paths you might take exploring a cave, and and then you you fall through a chute and you come out in a particular time. So it was a way of getting to different times, and so that you could have quite rich adventures that way and um, you either in the past or the future. So uh, there was a lot of opportunity for material. Uh, and that was, turned out to be a very good choice for the mm -hmm. uh, book. Still one of my favorites. Now, you, you mentioned before Inside UFO 5440. Now, when I read every book, I would always put a check mark next to the ending <laughs> that I read. So at the end, I could skim through the book and see if there were any that I missed. So with this book, like you mentioned, there was one and there was just no way to get to that ending. And it drove me crazy because I kept wondering how I missed the pages to get to it. So it was only later that I found out that there was no way to get to it without cheating. So what made you decide to do that? And did you get any <laughs> flack from Bantam or any other readers from that? Well, I just I just thought it would be fun. <laughs> <It would> be <laughs> fun. But I got to say that a lot of, you know, I I felt, you know, I didn't want to be unfair to the readers. Uh, I didn't want to <laughs> be accused of be, being a sadist or anything. But uh, so I didn't in, insist that that warning page have a little, have hints in it. And if you have a copy of that still, you'll see the warning page is not the standard warning page. It, it gives, it says sometimes, you know, you can't do this and it, it, it was a very broad hint. And the thing is though, that so many people had read books before that, uh, that they didn't bother reading the warning page. They all thought, oh, well, I know what the warning page is. I don't, don't need to read that. Uh, so they skip <laughs> over it. It's, you know, uh, very understandable. So for those people that were like you, there was, what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> I did read it at the time because I went through, I just, I told you, I always do check off the endings <laughs> that I read. So I, I did yeah. not see it. I did not yeah. see a pen mark yeah. next to it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, I want to talk about hyperspace. Uh, even back then, when I was reading, that book stood out to me because it was so different than all the other books. It was very self-referential. You got to read books within the books. The characters knew that they were in a book, and you even made an appearance. It, it was such an anything-goes tone. What made you decide to do that? And again, how was the reception from Bantam and readers at the time for that one? Yeah, well, I think people like Typer. That's certainly one of my most uh, books I've gotten most uh, comment on in uh, letters from readers. Uh, and and uh, the uh, hyperspace is, you know, it's it's a kind of funny word. It is it. It I guess it can mean extra dimensions or things that are, don't seem to be in accord with the laws of physics or the the way uh, the universe is laid out as far as we can understand it. But uh, there's uh, it gets into all kinds of things like uh, uh, loops uh, and tunnel tunnels that you can get to a different time. By the way, the uh, Carl Sagan, the famous astronomer who, who is uh, uh, right, Wrote, did the series Cosmos on television many decades ago. He wrote wrote a novel, and uh, he had uh, he went he wanted to get his character, who was played by Jodie Foster, in a book I think it was called and a movie okay. called Contact, right. and uh, she 
how does she get to uh, this distant planet? And she she got into a uh, uh, a, a tunnel, a time tunnel, or uh, or time space tunnel. And the, the you know with mathematics, uh, all kinds of configurations are thought of, are developed that that can't be experienced. And and <laughs> the idea being. Uh, how could there possibly be a way to travel faster than light, which you definitely needed to do to get to this planet where Jodie Foster arrived? Right. And so uh, that there was that's it was quite a bit of talk of hyperspace in those times without anybody knowing exactly what it was, except that it was very weird. So I thought this is a chance to write a book in which all kinds of weird things happen, including having me appear in the book as a character. And uh, and, and uh, of course, you, the reader, you're, you're, you're in a bad spot when you meet me, the author, and you think, oh, the author is here. Maybe he can help me. He knows what's going on in this book. But unfortunately, I fell through a crevasse at that point. <laughs> and so the poor readers were left on their own. <laughs> So we have to ask you if you've seen the movie Knives Out and then kind of naming a character after your character, Harlow Thromby. How, how did you feel about that? Well, I I uh, I got a letter from a former fan saying, you better check this out. They're ripping <laughs> you off from Harlow. Uh, so I got got the movie and watched it. And uh uh, it, the char my character's name was Harlow. Th who my book was Who Killed Harlow Thromby, and uh, the guy in the movie was Harlan Th Thromby. So, ah, okay. But uh, uh, there were some slight parallels, as there are in any murder mystery, where you're trying to who's the murderer and so forth. But basically, the the plot was not a copy of my I plot. I, the guy they they didn't rip me off and I could con consider it was sort of flattering that they used Harlow Thumbby so I uh, I found it more amusing than an, any an annoying. I took it as an homage, <laughs> to <be> right? <laughs> yeah. that, I, I also have to ask: Was Doctor Vivaldi, who was in so many books, was that based Dr. on anyone? Vivaldi, <laughs> She's a, she was an expert in interspecies communication. Uh, so very good for talking to aliens, but Doctor, uh, I you know these books generally were standalone books. So we're not continuing characters except for you, the reader, and they're the situations, the times, the circumstances are very different. There were no running themes, but uh, I thought it'd be kind of interesting to have a a character in one book come back in another book, and so uh, I I. I I thought, you know, uh, uh, I, I I knew there was a composer named uh, Antonio Vivaldi, a famous Italian composer. So I just liked that name. Um, and so I thought of Dr. Vivaldi. <laughs> and and she, she does appear in, in maybe half a dozen or more. Several of my, books, yes. Yeah. Now, in the 80s, there started to be a whole bunch of knockoff series, like along the same pattern. Do you remember discussing that at the time, that all these other companies started like publishing the same type of thing as you. Yeah, well, uh, when I uh, I knew that uh, you can't copyright an idea, uh, you can't patent an idea. So uh, once the idea was out and the series is doing so well, it was natural for uh, other companies to to copy it and try try to bring them out. Uh, but they uh, and generally they they had not uh not very good titles or for or trademarks for their type i remember one one was called uh well well it was which way which is kind of a name and and uh uh decide your fate and so forth and uh the the nothing was quite sm as smooth as choose your own adventure uh it, it, even though uh, when I, that, that that was thought up by Libincott, as I said in my first books before Bantam got in the picture, but Libincott failed to copyright it uh, <laughs> to, to, to trademark, excuse me. Um, and uh, I thought, I thought, gee, that choose your own adventure doesn't really describe it. 
because you're 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 on an adventure and you're choosing your own way of yeah. handling the situation. So it's not that you it's not like you're choosing uh, an adventure in the book. So I didn't think that was so great, but actually it turned out to be a very uh, mellifluous and, and, and people took to it. And so now you still hear people talking about it. It's, a, it's your own adventure situation. <laughs> well, even, even Choose Your Own Adventure started spinning off into other areas. I mean, all these other like licensed brands became involved. Like I remember the Indiana Jones, yeah. Star Wars. So uh, were you for that at the time? All the other uh, licensing things? Well, I did some of... Uh, uh, I. Well, Bantam did some some series uh, of uh, sub series. Mm -hmm. They had a series of choose your own adventure for younger readers. Sure. They also brought uh, brought out, and I wrote a couple books for choose your own a nightmare. Uh, you everybody's too young to remember most things. I remember <laughs> there was a a period uh, <laughs> when uh, horror books became tremendously in vogue. Uh, I guess this was the late 80s and early 90s uh, uh, and uh, R.L. Stein's books. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you knew of them, the uh, Goosebumps and so forth. Goosebumps and Twist the Plot. He was right, yeah. Uh, yeah. They, they be, so, so Bantam said, we got to get in on this horror stuff. So they thought that it choose your own a nightmare. And uh, we had... You know, there are a couple of others. Then I did a few spinoffs myself. Uh, Bantam did my book, uh, Space Hawks, which is kind of like Top Gun, mm -hmm. only you're a space pilot. And instead of being uh, working for the United States Air Force or Navy or whatever, that you were representing Earth trying to stave off alien attacks. So that was a spinoff. I did it, another spinoff called with a McGraw Hill called Earth Inspectors. Uh, none of these took off, took off anything like uh, Choose Your Own Adventure, mm -hmm. though. Um, but they were they were fun. Well, your daughter eventually wrote for the series as well. How how great was that for you? Since she was the one that started it for you in the first place. Well, well. <laughs> That was nice that she, you know, she could write her own, and and uh, <laughs> then uh, the last book uh, in the series we uh, we wrote together, uh, which was I uh, at that at that point, Bannon was you know ready to shut down the series. Mm -hmm. uh, was time was running out, you know. The, the, these series are like bell curves; they they mm -hmm. up and they go very high, and then they tail off. Well, this was. By then, this was in the late '90s. It was really tailing off, but we had one more book. So, uh, and that one was I would call it Bush Pilot. But by that time, they, the editors weren't paying much attention to me, and they changed the name to Mayday, uh, which I didn't like. But uh, anyway, it was uh, that was nice having her, her involved, and some other people uh, wrote books. Uh, uh, my partner Sarah Compton wrote a book called Daredevil Park, which is a horrific uh, theme park uh, <laughs> thing where you know <laughs> the rides go very much wrong. <laughs> as a matter of fact, uh, to do research in that, we we went, went to Disneyland in Orlando, and I went on their roller coaster space. Mountain, which I thought was the most horrible experience of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, in the book Daredevil Park, things are even scarier. Uh, <laughs> well, you had, you had mentioned the, the series discontinued like in the late 90s. So Random House, which had acquired Bantam, let the trademark of the title lapse. So how does that happen? <laughs> a company lets the trademark lapse? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, 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 well, I knew the series was right, right, sort of losing steam and so forth, but it never entered my mind that uh, Bantam, that uh, Random House would let the trademark lapse because uh, it had been so valuable, but and they could keep it uh, under their control with just very modest uh, public publications. Uh, 
it was it was like turning out the pilot light on a stove, you know, and it can't be lit again. And uh, I was uh, in that period. I was I was no more not really interested in the series anymore. I was trying to write other books. I wrote a nonfiction book about the visualizing the universe and uh, some other things. That uh, just my whole uh, focus is turning toward trying to do other things. And uh, so I wasn't paying attention and it went out, the series ended. And the next thing I knew is that uh, Montgomery uh, had registered the trade, Bantam had abandoned the trademark or either abandoned it or they sold it to, or, or gave it or alerted Montgomery that they were abandoning it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he registered in his, under the name of his new company, which was called Choose Co, uh, which has continued to put out new books and reprints uh, of previous books that by Montgomery and his his people and his family. And uh, so uh, how this actually happened, I don't know. I think Random House should have offered it to both of us. Uh, uh, and... Uh, um, I so I just don't know, but I, I wasn't paying attention. Um, as I wrote in my memoir, The View from 90, which is on my website, <laughs> uh, okay. I was sleepwalking most of the time and uh, not paying attention to the business things, even though I was a, a lawyer and should have known much better. Uh, <laughs> than to be sleepwalking uh, when it when a valuable trademark was it uh, involved but anyway it just that's you know that's the way life goes um, <laughs> uh, things slip by and sometimes you get some you take advantage of an opportunity and sometimes you miss out on it mm -hmm. well did it upset you that montgomery snatched up the trademark well it it was you know, because he could it, have offered to share it with you too. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we, we were not in a. He had, we had had differences uh, over how we characterized the series, and I I wouldn't want to get into that. Uh, but uh, so our our we did not have a good relationship at that the, by that so there's, point. There's no interaction with the Montgomery family now. Pardon me. There's no interaction with the Montgomery family now. No. no uh, no, and as I say, emotionally, I'm I'm interested in other things sure. uh, and other projects, and uh, and I've been very lucky, and uh, so I, you know, I'm not I I, I would be uh, I wouldn't enjoy any kind of confrontation or sure. negotiation. I, I feel that's just another a, a past chapter in history. Uh, well, let's let's talk about briefly the other things that you you've mentioned. You venture and that you produced apps for phones. I know that. So, what is the future for you with interactive fiction, or what other projects are you working on now? Well, I I am uh, I re wrote a, no a novel, a science fiction novel, and I'm I'm going to uh, offer that on my website uh, with uh, for with a chance for readers to read the opening pages and if they like it they can download the whole book free and uh, i i'm uh i'm having a, i've had a lot of fun with that and also i do a daily blog uh where i pretty much uh i didn't mean to write about politics all the time because it's not <laughs> my main interest but i started this uh after Trump got elected in 2016, and uh, I just kept it up. And um, uh, it's, you know, it's very good to keep a journal or something like that, you know, write down your uh, impressions every day. I have some some friends who do that, and I think they really, it helps you uh, write better, and it helps you place things in perspective and get your thoughts organized. And so uh, that's what I do. I found that true with my daily blog. Um, and uh, 
I, I've had some other products. I wrote a memoir of growing up in the 1930s and 1940s. Hmm. And I also have my essay, uh, The View from 90, <laughs> all on my website, edwardpacker.com. And uh, so I'm hoping to have some fun with interaction with, uh, re with readers uh, uh, with my new novel, because I start out with an author's note uh, saying, you know, this novel explores certain things that are of interest to thinking people, like the uh, yeah, the, fu with the future with artificial intelligence, to give you an example. And uh, so I'm hoping to develop some some, and I have had a lot of pleasure with the correspondence with former fans who are grown up and uh, <laughs> they've written me and I wrote back because they were interesting and uh, and uh, so I hope to have more of that too. We're going to put well, a link to the to your website on it as oh, well. Yeah, absolutely. We will uh, we will push that especially on the the youtube version of of the show so we have to ask of all the choose your own adventure books which was your particular favorite well uh it's very hard to pick out just one i mean sugarcane island is certainly was one of my i have to put on the short list because it was the one that started it all it was my original idea and sort of the archetypal adventure of being shipwrecked on a strange island and but i also uh am very very fond of uh, the the uh hyperspace <laughs> because i got in it <laughs> i made i made it into the action well uh and I, uh, another book i liked a lot uh which sold very well by the way though it didn't it, uh it was later on in the series was called the worst day of your life I have... <laughs> and talking about kids what kind of endings they want and bad and good and so forth that book sold much much better than another book choose book i wrote called the best day of your life <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah there you go <laughs> it's more interesting what happens as, as long as it's not actually happening to you, you know? sure <laughs> so, so choose your own adventure has definitely left an impact people around the world know what it is they know the brand you just hear it so how, how proud of you of the legacy that you're leaving with this how what how proud of you are of you oh, about this legacy well, I decided that people shouldn't be proud. Isn't proud being proud supposed to be a sin? So <laughs> I, I I try not to be proud. I'm, I'm very happy. You know, I had actually had a, a college alumni uh, uh, a yearbook coming out. Uh, you know, they have a, I don't know if they do this where you went, but they have a yearbook come out uh, when you have a college reunion of a big year of a major anniversary of your college graduation. And so they wanted uh, people, uh, This the, the guys who were editing this book said, uh, uh, well, besides giving you your details of where you're living, what you, this and that, uh, say what's m most important to you in life and so forth. And so I thought, well, I, I thought, uh, I thought most important maybe is the knowing that millions of kids like my books a lot. And uh, so if I, if I were proud, which as I say, I'm against being, I would probably say that that was what I'm proud of. That's, that's great. I, I just want to again, you know, thank you. I, you know, like I told you at the beginning, your books are a big part of my childhood and they, they mean a lot to me and i know that they mean a lot to everyone else around the world and it was such an absolute pleasure for, to get to speak to you today and i sincerely thank you for coming on with us well it's been my my pleasure talking to you and i'm very glad the books are still part of your grown up hood yes they, i have, <laughs> I have oh, I've introduced my my kids to them as well but okay. uh We'll we'll let you know when this is on. But again, thank you, thank you okay. so much. <laughs> but Many thanks. thanks. This okay, is, this has been Pop Culture Retro. I'm Jonathan Rosen with Ike Eisenman, and again, very special thanks to Edward Packard. 
and please subscribe. Thank you for listening to Pop Culture Retro, where no one was hurt during the making of this podcast.